Louis Greenberg was a staff attending surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic with appointments in vascular surgery and biomechanical engineering. He was head and co-founder of the clinic's aortic center. He authored over 200 papers, held over 50 patents, and inspired a generation of vascular surgeons. If surgery were a sport, he'd be first team all about. He died on the 7th of December 2013 at his home on the shores of Lake Erie, with his family beside him at the age of 49, after a long run was born with great fortune. He was decades ahead of his time. He was born to Donald and Iris on the 9th of November 1964 in Ithaca, in upstate New York, where Donald was professor of computer graphics at Cornell. His middle name, Kenneth, was a passing reference to his father's admiration for John F. Kennedy. He went to college in Cornell choosing the University of Cincinnati in Southern Ohio for a medical school, primarily he told me because it had a good program for emergency medicine. He chose surgery, however, and joined the residency program at the University of Rochester in New York. Roy started off interning in vascular surgery, and, and that was that. The department was only up. Chaired by Richard Green, the vice chair was Ken Oriel, who had moved to Cleveland as head of vascular and immediately recruited Roy. Roy's star quality was picked out early on, and he was encouraged to get involved in the new endovascular treatments for aortic aneurysms. Endografting combined aortic surgery with vascular imaging, engineering, and design, all of which held great opinion for Roy. After residency, he stayed in Rochester for his fellowship and then demonstrated great foresight, as you heard earlier, by heading to Malmo in Sweden for an international uh, radiology, er, sorry, an international radiology fellowship under Krasi and then it was all himself. I first met Roy in 2001. I'd been trying to set up an endo fellowship for myself without much success, but a chance phone conversation with Connor Delaney put me in touch with Roy. He ran me and said he was going the following week to an FDA out of town meeting for medics, regulators, and industry, and what he described as some place in Ireland called the K Club. He suggested that I could meet him there, and I went along with over a pint of medics he offered me a fellowship. That began the K Club played host to the great and the good of vascular surgery. He introduced me to Juan Crowley and a host of others. They all showed great warmth towards Roy and told me how lucky I was to get the chance to work with him. They weren't wrong. Roy had the rare skill of combining the skills of innovation and project planning with technical excellence as a surgeon. He made everything look so easy. You had to watch every move he made, you'd miss key parts of the procedure. The best comparison I can make is that watching him do a complex endo case was like watching a professional snooker player at the kind of big He was always about four or five holes ahead. He rarely ever got into trouble despite performing new procedures with multiple steps and untested materials. He was surprisingly relaxed. I bought his wife Alicia's car, and when I couldn't start it when I was trying to drive away from Roy's house. After a visit from the breakdown assist people, he realized it was my fault for not pressing the clutch as I turned the key. I thought I was on the nice plane home, but Roy thought it was hilarious, eventually. Another example of his catching style was when Sean O'Neill came to visit me in Cleveland to try and persuade Roy to take him on after I left. We ended up having dinner in the Blue Lagoon restaurant with Roy and Jeff White from Sydney, another vascular legend who tragically died last year. At this point, Sean hadn't quite got to the point of asking Roy for a job. Roy was explaining to Jeff his research on what I was up to. He then stated that Sean would be taking over the project. Sean looked at me and said, I hear what I think I heard, but that was Roy. There was no formality. In 2002, despite all of the innovation, a slow, regulatory process meant that only two proprietary endovascular grafts were available for widespread use. These devices were outdated, but the newer devices were in the approval process and only available to operating surgeons if they had what was called an implantation device exemption. Roy had a whole bunch of these IEDs, so many of his colleagues needed Roy's involvement to be able to use these devices. He had great power and influence, but was always modest and obliging. He always had engineers and design specialists employed as part of his research team, and with strong industry connections, most notably with Cook Medical. His large number of IDEs reflected the time and effort that had been put into the more mundane and regulatory aspects of device approval. The people in Washington recognized a good thing when they saw it, so Roy's operating list always had a sprinkling of politicians, judges, and other capital hill types. He spoke to national prominence when he did an EMR on the Republican Senator and sent a majority of the to him. Roy used to say that he always meant it in New Zealand, he was the only Democrat in the department. And this, uh, this was not much of a revelation, I can assure you. Roy's biggest achievements were in the development field of complex aortic endogramming. Roy made fenestrated and branch graph development his own, personally implanting over a thousand devices and leading the way in developing the technology and training many of the new users in the field. 
and recognition of these and recognition of these achievements, he was awarded the clinic, uh, treatment clinic master clinician award by his peers in 2012. Roy received many awards, but regarded this with particular pride. Team Greenberg always had young homely surgeons beavering away in the endovascular room or in the design labs. There have been quite a few of the current of the past few years who have been directly influenced and inspired by Roy and are now doing great things themselves. Roy felt the world to be a small place. He loved traveling and loved working with and training international surgeons. People like Stefan Paolo and me and Tim Raj and Malmo, who were disciples of Roy, leading the endovascular charge in the room. And of course, we're delighted to have one of Roy's favorites, Tara Mastracci, here with us today. Roy married, married fellow surgeon and Rochester surgery resident Alicia Fanning in 2002. The ceremony was conducted by the Supreme Court Judge Luke Ginsburg. Alicia and the two boys, Zach and Lucas, were number one in Roy's life. Our deepest sympathy goes to Alicia and Zach and Lucas, as well as Roy's parents, Donald and Iris, and siblings, Eric and Jean. There has rarely been any period over the last decade when Roy didn't have a fellow from Ireland. Sean Lee, Joan Dowdle, Zina Martin, Adrian O'Callaghan all spent time with Roy and each developed strong relationships with the community. <coughs> I suppose we all worked hard because we realised just what a special person the leader Roy was and how privileged we were to get the chance to work with. It is for these reasons, and in particular, his great contribution to Irish surgery, that I would ask the president of the college, Professor Patrick Rowe, to present the college medal to Tyra Mastracci on behalf of the main college. Thank you. Alicia has been in touch with Bridget Egan and you know, would have liked 